and we're off. So welcome to the very first uh, live streamed event here at uh, Lab Books, coming live from Princeton, New Jersey, uh, for P. Carl's uh, wonderful new memoir, Becoming a Man. Now, uh, we do have more books uh, or more events for uh, books coming up uh, in the future here for the next uh, couple months, and we're uh, keeping them in the works and trying to figure out how we can uh, bring those to the public via uh, um, mediums like crowdsource here. Um, so if you want to stay in the loop, uh, you can do that by joining our email subscriber list. And you do that by going to our website, uh, www.labyrinthbooks.com. And on the top right of the homepage is a little box that says, connect with us. And then you click on that and enter in your email to be added to our list. Or it can be as simple as following us on Facebook which is at Labyrinth Books Princeton on Facebook, and we post regular uh, daily updates on upcoming events. So both uh, great ways to stay in the loop. Now, uh, because of the whole ongoing uh, situation, our store hours have changed. Uh, we are uh, open to take phone orders and also web orders Tuesday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So give us a call anytime uh, during those hours at 609-497-1600. We are offering free shipping anywhere in the continental U.S. of A. So uh, we would love to uh, send something to you or uh, send a care package to someone in your circle, your friend group, your colleagues, whatever. Um, just another helpful reminder that uh, all orders that we will receive for this book, Becoming a Man, will automatically be 10% off, regardless of whether you're a member with us or not. Um, so we would love to uh, celebrate that. And uh, Carl here would also be happy to uh, personalize uh, any, uh, any books that you might want to have signed or written or addressed to you, something like that. Uh, we'll be sending book plates uh, in the future. And uh, he's graciously agreed to purchasely, uh, to um, personalize those book plates and have them sent back. So feel free to let us know if that's something that you're interested in. You can let us know either when you call in, again, 609-497-1600, or send an email to info hyphen pr at labyrinthbooks.com either way uh, we'll be happy to get you that book for 10 percent off now uh joining us for our first live stream again is carl who is a distinguished artist in residence at emerson college in boston and was awarded a 2017 art of change fellowship from the ford foundation and is currently uh serving uh, as a fellow at princeton university uh through the anschutz distinguished fellowship for spring 2020. he has worked primarily in theater for the last 20 years and now spends his days writing teaching giving zoom meetings traveling mountain climbing and swimming uh, he currently lives in boston with his wife lynette and i just want to once again welcome carl thank you so much for being here with us Really, really good to be here. Thank you. So um, we will be having some time, uh, uh, certainly towards the end, for uh, more questions and comments from the other live viewers here. Um, but I just wanted to uh, sort of get things started off and get the ball rolling on this talk and uh, get uh, start thinking about what your process was for uh, writing this book and specifically uh, how you came to realize that now was the time to do that as opposed to maybe earlier, uh, later, something like that. Yeah, uh, so I um, I started writing the book uh, really as kind of a survival mechanism uh, as I was uh, uh, sorting through uh, the, the process of transitioning, which is uh, not a short process and also is complicated. And so one of the things I, I guess I wanted to capture uh, in writing it was um, the uh, the really present tense nature of it. I felt like if I waited to write it after uh, the uh, the kind of emotional distance that one gets um, would, would have changed a lot of how the book uh, came out. Even currently I'm adapting the book into a play and it's very different now mm -hmm. to uh, be 
to be writing about these same things uh, than it was, you know, a couple of years ago when I was actually writing the book. And so uh, I really uh, uh, felt like the writing was, um, uh, you know, it, it was kind of life saving. I mean, when you uh, if uh, the the letter um, in the book that I, I write to my wife is actually a letter I, I wrote to her uh, mm -hmm. on an airplane. Um, uh, and uh, and so uh, for me, um, I guess I wanted I wanted to convey, uh, you know, the real um, the, the real the mess of uh, 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 <laughs> the mess of transitioning, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the mess of living, I think that we can all relate to more so now than ever. But um, and, and just really how. Uh, there's nothing about transitioning that is predictable or linear or, um, you know, uh, uh, it's not something you can, it's something you experience. And I wanted to do my best to bring the reader along in that experience. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you definitely achieved that. Um, sort of going off of uh, that, and when you had mentioned that uh, you wrote a letter to uh, your wife, and this is uh, taking place uh, on a plane mid-flight and everything, I did notice that uh, different chapters of your book are uh, written in very disparate places, and they include, uh, help me if I'm missing one, but uh, Seattle, Berlin, Boston, Indiana, and again, the, the plane flight, that sort of thing. Um, so I- The Dolomites in Italy, yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, uh, I'm just curious if there was uh, any sort of conscious thought to writing about uh, certain aspects of your life and your transition as you found yourself in these different places, or did it just sort of more uh, ad hoc come to you? I think the idea of the locations was the was really uh, uh, tied to the idea that in transitioning, every place you go you are someone different. So when I would go home uh, to Elkhart, Indiana, where my family is from, uh, it, it was, it, it, I, I could not escape uh, my history of having been the only daughter in the family, for example, right? So, mm -hmm. that, so entering that space, there was one me. Um, when I was in Boston with people who knew me and were, you know, had been watching me transition, that was another uh, version of me. Uh, when I'm hiking in the Dolomites um, with, uh, uh, you know, people uh, I don't know and traveling around the world, uh, there's another me. Um, and in each of those spaces, uh, I was able to, you know, a lot of different feelings emerged uh, that were, um, you know, in some ways uh, going to Indiana obviously took me back uh, in time. Being in the Dolomites made me think about what my future might look like. Uh, and so I really um, I felt like, uh, location and identity are so uh, oddly tied, and I, okay. I guess that was another piece of um, how I structured the book. So, okay, great. Now, um, that wife, that that um, letter to your uh, wife is really um, such a I, I felt uh, uh, emotionally raw and vulnerable and uh, important moment in the book. Um, why don't you uh, talk a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, the letter, uh, uh, you know, it, it, again, in hindsight, one of the, one of the things about the letter, uh, it, the book, obviously, as any book, I went through a lot of editing. And I think the one thing that almost wasn't edited at all was the letter. Like I wrote it yeah. in one draft and it was the same mm -hmm. letter, and it stayed the same in the book. And it, you know, it just was one of those things that uh, came out of me in a particular time and way. And I think that it was, um, I think one of the hardest things when you're going through something that is so required, you know, it's it's so self-involved. I, I, you know, in the book I call it, uh, it, it's nothing if not a narcissistic moment in time where you're like, am I me yet? Am I me yet? Do I look like me? And and it's, it was so so hard to understand mm -hmm. what my uh, wife was experiencing. And and honestly, I mean, in hindsight, it, like as a gender studies theorist for twenty some years that I didn't think it was going to upend her life uh, it, it, it speaks to perhaps my, um, uh, you know, my, com my complete stupidity. Uh, but I think uh, I, I just, in my mind, I was the same person that always loved her and I didn't, I, you know, of course, uh, as a lesbian of 40 years, I, I, uh, it, it would matter who was in her bed, but it, it, for some reason, I just couldn't think of it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was so, 
uh, and so I think the letter was me trying to sort out uh, what I couldn't, you know, I couldn't feel what she was feeling. And, and in, in the letter, I try to I try to figure out what that is, you know. Mm -hmm. So was uh, was this like a sort of exercise where, you know, you like if you're really mad, you just write something down just to like get it out, but you don't necessarily send it. Or was this actually something even if you didn't send it? uh and as it was to her this was something that opened up more uh conversations and uh going deeper yeah i mean it, it, it i actually did send it to her uh okay. from uh, from the airplane I, I believe and uh um and uh, i did send it to her and I, I think it opened up a lot of conversation for us i mean we had many uh phases of of, of coming to understanding each other in this process and and i think that letter was a, an opening because talking was very in person talking was very difficult and it was actually a good friend who said to me um it was actually a good friend uh who said to me that uh um uh, uh you know why don't you try writing a letter and uh, that that's what i did so and, and and it was it was easier than in-person conversation to allow an opening so okay yeah so um Oh, uh, I think we're just having a little uh, faint audio. Not that it's gone completely. So uh, if is it uh, you could just, or is it? Uh... I th I think it's on. I think it's just on your end. But if you just speak up just a little bit, I think oh, yeah. it should rectify itself. Yeah, yeah. But I'm happy to Great. speak. Up. And if that helps, uh, I hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, also uh, important relationships that come up in this book are both your father and uh, your father-in-law. And uh, they are uh, present uh, and uh, there in different ways and for different reasons. Now, could you just unpack a little bit more about what those relationships really meant to you? Yeah, I mean, the my, my father, the relationship, obviously, when you read the book, it's, it's very painful and complicated. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I know people feel when they read the book, oh my God, he was so terrible. And, 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 and in many ways he, he, he really was. And also, I also loved him, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because he's my father and, uh, uh, and I could never, uh, I mean, I don't know, do you ever reconcile the inability to reconcile with the parent? I, I, I don't know. I, I never really could do that. Uh, my father's passed away. He had not passed away when I finished the book. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, uh, but um, uh, the uh, um, you know so so I think it's very complex and and I think it, it, there's a section in the book where my brothers uh, and I are texting each other going are we like him uh, are we not like him uh, mm -hmm. and all three of us wanting not to replicate uh, a lot of who he was um, and mm -hmm. then you know, many uh, my my wife and I have been. Uh, uh, together about uh you know we've been together 22 years now so I, I i knew her father for a long time and he really uh gave me like an a, a, an idea of what a father was like and uh what it was like to be around a really good man and uh um he wasn't uncomplicated either as i talk about in the book but right uh, he um he really uh he was really a uh, really an amazing guy uh you know a, a sort of first generation italian who uh had no reason to embrace uh his uh queer daughter uh no reason to embrace us as a couple uh he and i were like i felt like a, a son to him and um and we just loved hanging out we loved arguing politics when it used to be fun to argue politics which it's not now but uh, uh <laughs> you know there's mm -hmm. 10 years ago or so that times on. yeah um, <laughs> um, and so uh we uh yeah we just kind of liked hanging out and uh and he really um uh kind of gave me a, a path to thinking about my own coming into being so okay great um do you i mean you 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 just said just now that he, uh as a first generation italian your father-in-law Frank had no reason to. What do you think uh, made such a big difference in his uh, reaction and acceptance of you and uh, your coupledom? You know I, what I say in the book about Frank and what I loved about him is 
you, he, you know, he sometimes he'd take these political positions, but he never lived those political positions. Like they'd be these, you know, uh, you know, these uh, kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps Republican uh, positions, which you know he and I would argue about. But when Frank met a person, he met the person he was meeting. He didn't uh, make assumptions. He didn't make judgments. And he really took people on their own terms. And I think I just, I learned a lot from that. And so he didn't, uh, he, he didn't judge, uh, he didn't judge me, uh, mm -hmm. he got to know me uh, and uh, he didn't make assumptions. And also he was just an incredibly loving father. He loved his kids and he loved uh, uh, Lynette, my wife. And, uh, um, and if, if, if she loved me, he was gonna figure out how to make that happen too. And, and so I just, I felt like, God, if we could, you know, if we could, if, if we could all be a Frank in this world now, how, how different it would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned a lot about trying to know people that way. So mm -hmm. that reminds me of uh, what my uh, parents would sometimes say when you assume you make an ass out of you and me. Yeah. So yeah. assumptions, never good things to have. Yeah. Um, uh, just a reminder for those who are watching live, we are uh, inviting questions and uh, any sort of uh, uh, things that come to come to mind, uh, feel free to drop something in the comment box, which you can see to the bottom right of your screen, I'm pretty sure. Um, I do want to ask uh, uh, something else, just while everyone else, uh, the uh, some 20 people uh, who are watching live, maybe mull something over, think of something. Um, how did you come to grapple and wrestle with um, relishing uh, masculine attributes that one might that one typically associates with uh, white cis men? And you talk about you know um, going to bars, drinking beers, and mountain climbing, and really relishing so much of that, while at the same time, uh, uh, around the same time the whole uh, hashtag me too movement is getting underway in America. And there's all this uh, reckoning going on between power disparities uh, and uh, abuses between genders. Yeah, I, I mean, as I say in the book, it, you know, I, I didn't feel like I picked a really great time to become a, a white man uh, in uh, as the Kavanaugh hearings were happening, um, uh, you know, and uh, other mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Weinstein um, and obviously had the, the Me Too the Me Too movement uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, in some ways uh, my masculinity has been actually consistent over most of my life in a strange way. I kind of like uh, I've always kind of been a you know whatever I don't know, whatever kind of a guy's guy in a way. I like hanging out in the gym. I like hanging out in the bar. I like you know I like you know playing sports i'm uh, uh mm -hmm. watching them you know, it's a, but like, <laughs> I, I and i guess i it, it's interesting because in some ways we associate that with the kind of a, a toxic kind of masculinity and i don't think those things are inherently uh toxic i think uh, uh you you can be toxic in really any context uh and uh, very true very true you know, so i uh and I, i've met a lot of great uh met a lot of great people uh, I'm I'm a kind of watcher. I feel like an anthropologist sometimes, and I love hanging out and, and chatting with people. So, uh, uh -huh. awesome. Ah, uh, great. Uh, I do see two questions here. Great. Um. Uh. So, do I just hit on start answering? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Oh. Um. Or I can answer. I, I can see them now. I just pulled them up. So. Oh, great, great. Okay. Uh, there's one quick question here, which is yes. The answer is um, I was with Lynette before I transitioned. We had been together almost 20 years um, before I transitioned, so it was a huge uh, upheaval uh, uh, for our our, our marriage. Um, and uh, so um, that's a, a short answer. Uh, um, the other question I have here: uh, uh, Do you uh, remember how old you were when you started to realize that you wanted? needed to be a male uh and um the answer to that question is uh, uh i really knew uh i was a boy uh by age four i was certain that i was a boy and it was almost impossible uh to um convince me otherwise uh and of course uh, of course uh i i you know i'm not a, uh i'm of another generation and so there was no uh uh, there was absolutely no possibility that by the time I turned six, seven, or eight, uh, and I have, you know, I, I put some pictures on my website of me in my first communion dress, uh, there was no way I was going to escape 
uh, my, you know, uh, my, my reality of being uh, labeled a girl. And so it, in some ways it felt like uh, I knew uh, very early on and then um, sort of knew uh, at different points it was unbearable to live as a, a you know, a, a, I mean, my body actually very physically responded to uh, things like the very first girl sleepover I went to, I had uh, my first panic attack. Um, you know, I went to a thing called Girls State in Indiana and had a complete, you know, nervous breakdown. Like every time, you know, I, I was in places where uh, I had no capacity to um, access any uh, sense of myself. Uh, so I, I always sort of knew, but a, a part of what you do to survive that in a culture that does not allow you to be visible or exist is you unknow what you know. Um, and so I spent a lot of years unknowing what I knew uh, and then um, uh, uh, knowing it again. So, um, but really at it, but by age four, it was, I, I was, I never, ever, I never thought of myself as anything but a boy. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and it really took a lot of work to um, uh, shake that out of me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I I did uh, take one comment from uh, the the column over here on the right, and I moved it over. And there are also two others. Are you able to see those? Let me pull them up now. They uh, cover my screen, and I do it. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yes, I've got a couple uh, here. Great. Yeah, and those all sound great. So I'd love to hear it. Um. Uh, great. So. Uh, uh, what advice would you give to parents who have a child who's expressing that they feel they have been assigned the wrong gender in terms of helping them transition? Uh, it's a really great question. Uh, I've actually talked with a lot of parents on the book tour. Uh, and uh, it's, um, I mean, uh, I'm not a parent, so uh, I say this uh, with great respect uh, to the difficulties of that. But uh, there, in the book, I write about my, um, uh, my wife's cousin's uh, son but born a, a boy mm -hmm. and uh, a lover of every possible thing connected to uh, the girl the girl of uh, the girliest of girl things uh, in you know in cliche ways and in every other way wanting to be a princess Elsa every Halloween for five Halloweens I think <laughs> and, uh, you know sewing his own gowns and that kind of thing and I've watched her parents him and uh, again I use him now I don't know what uh, uh, he hasn't. Uh, he's not. He hasn't expressly said, uh, but uh, what what gender he thinks he is, or sexual orientation, or any of those mm -hmm. things. But he's uh, what. But the freedom to be himself is what I've seen them uh, as a family encourage, and I see him just thriving as who he is in this moment. And I imagine that could evolve in a lot of different directions. Um, I think if a child is saying that. Uh, and they're a child, they know something uh, deep inside. And I think that, uh, and how do you honor that, I think is, is by listening and, uh, uh, and being as open uh, as you can to m making you know, as much of the world uh, possible uh, as you can. And, uh, and just, I, I think people sort of find themselves, I have no idea what would have happened if somebody just sort of let me be the boy that I was. I don't know, you know but mm -hmm. I, I have a feeling uh, it would have been a really different, uh, a really different life for me and and as you read in the book uh it's a very painful thing uh to never feel embodied and if it means that uh, your child is going to get to feel embodied for a long time in their lives uh what um what greater gift uh, could a parent give uh to a child i guess is my, my thought mm -hmm. um yeah uh so um uh uh the, another question i have here is um how have people reacted to your book as i've toured it uh yeah i've had a really great time uh touring it uh it was m much more fun to tour it live although i'm happy to be online here uh but uh <laughs> i got to see a lot of people the beautiful part of uh touring the book was that i did meet uh, uh people who had come up to me and said you know i have a, a child i have a friend who has a child uh i was in uh, uh i was in san francisco and much uh, some kind of older guys were there and I, I didn't know they were all trans guys but they were all trans guys who had all kind of ever given up the thought of being you know trans just trying to pass and fit in and and they talked to me for a long long time uh and uh so it, it was sort of like every kind of person came out uh i met a lot of um 
you know, guys my age who are trying to explore masculinity, uh, and wanting to have those kind of conversations. Uh, and so um, the tour, uh, uh, I don't know, it's it really a bit, has been a wonderful experience to uh, be able, I think, to, uh, you know, talk more deeply about some pieces of the book and just uh, to meet people and to see where they are uh, around um, this very complicated subject matter. So um, uh, another uh, great question uh, here. Um, my wife is actually upstairs with the two dogs, so we could ask her, but I won't. Uh, how has it been for your wife to live with the book now that it's out? Um, uh, I, I think she'll probably hear me upstairs. So I'm going to say that she's loved every minute of it. I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> it's a, uh, uh, it's been uh, terrifying for both of us. Uh, it's a very personal book, um, and uh, and I think uh, you know, I will say uh, I, we have never been closer. And uh, she's been so incredibly supportive of this process of the book coming out. She's writing her own story. She's a tremendously talented writer, uh, and uh, um, uh, and so I think we've been really supportive. And it's the the the, the thing that we're most terrified of is. Uh, I'm adapting it as a play, and we've both decided that there's no possible way we could watch people perform us on stage. So uh, we, are, I don't think we can watch the play, but um, mm -hmm. that, that seems much more terrifying than the book to both of us. So mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I think that's. Did I get them all? Uh, I do have just one last question uh, yeah. myself, uh, because oh, you talk about yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you talk about um the uh the uh, at least I think a couple therapists that uh, you've had uh throughout your life and during your transition. Um, so I guess my question is, what has what is it that you um look for most uh in uh, a therapist, or what would you recommend to somebody who's going through this transition in trying to find somebody who can help them uh, clinically like walk through it because of course there's family and friends that you uh, need in support but uh, what would what would you um, recommend to look, look for in a clinical aspect? Yeah I mean one of the things I would say about transition is it takes like you need a lot of people I say this in the book you need like two lawyers like three or four doctors therapists I mean it's like a, it's a lot of people uh, giving you the support you need. Uh, uh, it's complicated to change your name. It's, uh, I mean, there's just a million things that are uh, difficult in terms of the healthcare system. Uh, and in terms of um, the, you know, exploration with a therapist, I, 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 I really looked for somebody who uh, had a lot of experience with trans uh, clients who just, it, it, there was never a thing for that person to adjust to as me being a trans person. And actually the therapist went through the transition uh, with me. I, I, I had not begun uh, the, the full, you know, kind of physical transformation. And, uh, and I, I, it was just, I, you know, it, she never blinked an eye. And, uh, uh, and I think that expertise is really important. I think if you're a trans person and if you have a sense that your therapist is struggling with you, uh, that is not going to be uh, uh, very easy. So um, I, I think for any trans person, God, just just to feel seen, you know. Uh, and I felt like she saw me the first time we met and uh, has seen me since. So yeah. awesome! Yeah. That's really great to hear. So uh, in wrapping up, I think that um, you mentioned uh, at towards the beginning of your book that uh, in writing uh, you wanted. Uh, your purpose and your desire for this, uh, it, and specifically in this time, is um, just to uh, be a voice of help and to try and be uh, uh, even as personal as it is, just to provide uh, some sort of uh, context and uh, um, as an aid to people to who are curious, who want to know more, who are looking for help themselves. And I have to say that having read this book, uh, you've absolutely achieved that. So it's been a real uh, pleasure to read it. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough for uh, being so flexible and being here with us. And uh, just as a reminder, Becoming a Man, uh, available here at Labyrinth Books. And in- There's one other person who asked a question. I just answer uh, for uh, a person online, just really quickly, uh, uh, because I see them uh, commenting. Um, 
which sure. is uh, my pastor's son started transitioning at the age of three and my family thinks that's too young for a child to know their gender. Uh, and uh, um, uh, what I would say is, uh, I, 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 one of the things about, uh, to your question, to your kind of final comments there, Matt, about uh, I really wanted the book to be helpful. It asks a lot more questions than it answers. But I would say that um, I knew a lot about myself at age three, and I don't know when uh, particularly you signed into the conversation, but I said at, at age four, I was 100% a, a certain that I was a boy. And so I, I think listening, uh, uh, listening is important and exploring is important. Uh, what decisions get made, I, I, I don't, you know, that, that's a different question, I think, but, but the listening and believing that somebody is saying what they, what they know, even at three, uh, I, I probably could have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know, three or four, I was pretty, pretty, pretty clear for, for myself. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I got, I got one, make sure oh, they got oh, their answer. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, just as a uh, wrapping up, uh, Becoming a Man by P. Carl, available here at Labyrinth Book. Uh, send us an email or call in 609-497-1600. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening in. Hope you have a wonderful and safe evening. Thanks, everybody.